Hey, it's Chris. Crowdfunding Roundup. What are we doing this week? What if I told you one of the best games of the year is on crowdfunding right now again? What if I told you another one of the best games of the year just is getting delivered in the process right now to backers? Ooh, spoilers there, right? But you just want to know what's new on crowdfunding this week, a little bit more about it, and why you should maybe be interested in them. You ready? Let's go! So first up, Leviathan Wiles. Yes, I was alluding to this with a little teaser in the intro. This is gonna be one of my best games of the year. Is it perfect? No. Is it a lot of fun? Yes. Is it easy to get to the table? Yes. Can you screw things up and play badly and still have fun like I do all the time? Yes. And it's a good game. It's a good cooperative Shadows of Colossus style game, $234,000. And you're taking your little meeple here, opening your spiral bound notebook, climbing the monster using your several actions on a turn that you have available to you or a special ability, mixing, matching, repeating, bad guy going, card flipping, action ability, strong or weak, depending on what round it is, style of play. Go until, well, you can't anymore, essentially. Somebody dies because it's one of those cooperative games where if one person dies, it triggers the end game. You don't lose immediately, but everyone gets a last dash gasp, if you will. I love the little meeples here, folks. I love the fact that they went with accessibility and price point as a feature. I will not stop extolling that on this channel when people do it. I don't care who it is from that aspect of things. I would say maybe at the higher player count, your first game or two might be more than 60 minutes though. There's 17 of these Leviathans right here in the base game alone. Shuffle build your deck based off of a class and a faction essentially. And then, like I said, go around jumping, gliding, climbing, breaking the little crystals and forms of dice. It does get a little bit crowded in some of the areas when you're putting all of these things down in, in you know, essentially a very small spiral bound notebook. I mean, it's normal sized. I don't know why I said that, but that's probably one of the biggest issues that you're going to have with it, right? And don't listen to me, right? Don't listen to me. I don't listen to me extol it whatsoever. My opinion is stupid. My opinion is worthless, as I always say. Go hear these other people that are loving it because I think Shut Up and Sit Down, also NPI, just dropped their video the day this launched or so as well. And other people love it too. So again, as I say, don't listen to me go listen to all these other smarter people with better opinions than I have, right? If you want more, this expansion is going to give you more. Seven more Leviathans, a new climber, a new class. And people were commenting, and they actually put an update out as well, like right after the campaign launched, like, hey guys, there are some people complaining about the price. And they said, truth be told, you're just getting a freaking good deal with the base game, and expansions are always going to be less bang for your buck. And that's not any different here as it is in any other, just kidding, not any other, but a lot of expansions on any other campaign that's major, especially on crowdfunding, right? The joke is, or, you know, again, the publisher side of things, the hint, hint, wink, wink, that nobody really hides, but somehow consumers are always surprised by, right, is that the profit margin on a core game is a lot less. The profit margin on expansions is a lot higher, which is why you see a lot of publishers come out with expansions on crowdfunding, right? That's what makes sense. And so they're giving you more of a good thing if you want. Now, I wouldn't mind some of these acrylic tokens, to be frank with you. Um, you know, I don't need them. It'd be kind of cool, though. Active player marker. That's actually cool looking. Uh, reprint. Uh, I guess I'm going to need uh, the reprint upgrade at some point for first printing backers. So again, it's my kind of thing, like Z said there. And you can get all the other stuff, including the mutation pack that I have as well that adds extra difficulty. Uh, I don't have the wooden token set either. So again, I just maybe want to get some of those because, you know, it's worth getting now. If you know that you love it, you know, then you can maybe bling out a game or two. But I am really trepidatious nowadays about blinging out a game that I'm not sure I'm in love with from that aspect of things. But yeah, it's not going to be cheap, right? It's going to be a little bit of a price increase, I think, even from the first one. So do you want that? Is it for you? Is it not for you? The, the main criticism from the actual gameplay, again, see, look, right there, right? Right there, right? You don't have to even listen to me. I'm an idiot compared to all these people. So you can go get other stuff as well. There's my video. Um, 
but that's what you're getting here. The biggest criticism I have is I don't think the scaling is as good. It's really hard at two players. It doesn't quite have enough scaling, in my opinion, for some of those dynamics. But apart from that, I mean, if that's the bigger issue and you want to play with three, well, go check it out. Um, again, that's everything. That's everything. You're getting what it is. I don't think there are any stretch goals. You just get it. Indie company, get what you want. Get it here and get it if you like it and don't if you don't. So there you go. Leviathan Wilds. Zombie Horde from Dark Gate Games. Again, like Game Found with the rare win today, uh, this week, uh, with having like the two biggest campaigns launching on a week. So that's a great week for them. Uh, but Zombie Horde, right? 32 millimeter tactical co op. And it sort of gives me the vibes if Dead of Winter and Frostpunk met a skirmish you know tower defense game with miniatures right that's what this gives me heavy vibes of you can see it's going to be heavily miniature based it's line of sight range those sorts of things electrical generator tasks in a town defending against zombies and you're getting a free 20 dollars boss expansion that goes along with it if you're backing as a backer and the other fourth thing that they say that the fourth incentive to back it is you can do stretch pay. Stretch pay is ever one of your incentives to back something. That's a huge red flag, not for the company, but for you as a backer, right? However, I'm just going to read you uh, or give you a quick synopsis of what's on the page because I am not going to give you the quick synopsis of the rule book because the rule book, and maybe this is the biggest disclaimer I can say one way or the other, is 76 freaking pages. So there's a lot going on but maybe you skirmishers uh not as a pure co-op or dungeon crawl-esque vibe are going ah you know 76 skirmish that's fine i'm fine with that christian whatever but you get these jobs and you have asymmetric classes that have three different ways of you know essentially upgrading your classes as you specialize in your little barracks and you're defending the perimeter dealing with zombies the zombies can combine into towers that can actually go height wise because height and that sort of thing a la your regular skirmish games actually matters as well Again, freebie box, whatever that's going to be. They've got some stretch goals. There's the boss expansion. Uh, you can somehow be part of development. And they give you a little bit of what the overview of the individual asymmetric classes are going to be here with your ranges, your actions, and your attacks, if you will, as well. So your zombies or zombie-esque features right here, screamers, chained hordes, small hordes, and the pyramid that I was talking about where they combine to climb walls and go over the sides, right? So that's about it for on the page, though. You're not really going to get any more information on the actual page itself. I mean, they talk about what these colony tasks are, but they don't talk about how you're doing them or how you're going to be achieving them or, you know, the careers that I just mentioned with the asymmetric class options, uh, collaborative assault, because you basically add up your dice rolling uh, to see how many people can get hits on it to determine how much you're actually going to do damage wise. The 3D-ness that I mentioned there, as well as a couple gameplay or how to plays and then said rule book in the first place, but that's it. So, I mean, the main thing I, I'm missing on this page, you know, I love a rule book, I love a how to play, but why is this one different? That's what I just would love to see screamed on the page. But again, you're gonna have to go check out that rule book if you're interested in the first place, because again, 76 pages. And skirmish, take that for what you will, go check it out. Next up, this is my sleeper pick of the week because this is the reason I love doing this crowdfunding roundup because truth be told, I never would have found this or saw this unless I did this on a weekly basis, right? This is Panda Spin from Carl Chudik. You may know him from Innovation, Glory to Rome, right? Red 7. This is Panda Spin. This is a trick-taking game where you're actually trying to do a little bit of scout-esque features in one of the five different suits which are represented by the Chinese Zodiac animals. You're trying to be... Well, getting rid of your cards, discarding all of your cards to finish a round. And when all but one player have done that, the round ends. You're scoring points based on the tricks you play, the bombs you play, or the pandas you play. Because within each of these suits, there are going to be numbered cards, but then there are also going to be habsies, as you can see. There's going to be like a red card, white card side, and then there's going to be a blue card side. And so what happens is you discard your card if you win the trick. Everyone else has to take their card back. But if you lose the trick and you take your card back, you get to flip it around 180 scout-esque vibe and it becomes stronger so it's going to be easier to lose later so again strategically losing may behoove you to get out sooner later if that makes sense but there's also going to be element cards in each of these zodiacs that are going to be wilds essentially in some way shape or form but also special powers and a few icons that are in each suit as well including the bamboos and multiples of numbers in order to create those combinations of runs that are going to be playing higher because you have to play higher than your previous opponent opponent as you go around or you just have to beat them in other ways including the bomb which is specifically at least four of a kind in a bomb run 
or it's going to be an elemental card that can beat it as well. And let me be clear about this one too. This art looks freaking fan fantastic did i mention it's 18 dollars? and did i also mention that somehow they're going to have copies ready for essen pickup as well this year not next year so i'm intrigued uh you know again this one has gone right on my wish list because i think this is looking freaking good as someone who really loved trick takers again this is indie folks uh the stretch goals well they're getting some tokens and you're getting some uh, upgraded card stock that's it right that's it. That's the whole game. Win a trick, get 15 points, and then you win the game as a whole. Or you rinse and repeat and play another round until somebody gets there. That's it. $9 is going to be shipping. So again, it's probably maybe going to be slightly more expensive at $27, if you will. But, you know, wide retail? Mm, who knows with their first time game. So either way, go check it out and tell them Leech sent you. Panda Spin. Kickstarter. Stop it. You're drunk. Okay. So then we're going to go back over here to Winter Rabbit, a semi-cooperative worker placement game here set in the world of animal uh, Cherokee stories. And this game is giving you vibes of sort of an asymmetric six different animals that you have the potential of using in a three-ish phase worker placement style in sort of the morning, midday, and evening aspects. And what you're essentially doing is you're pulling these chits or bags from a tile, which are representing resources but also workers and so when one of these spots is full you flip them all face up because you're drawing them looking at them and then placing them wherever you want but there's also like a fox and if the fox goes there then they steal all the resources there and nobody gets any that you have to try and recapture later with further actions but if somebody places one of your worker tokens there or if your workers there, you're going to get extra resources as the main first part of this game there's also going to be other parts of the phase, the round, if you will, where you're going to have to have resources at the end of the round in the evening in order to achieve a shared victory or, well, defeat penalty, if you will, a la your Dead of Winter style, right? Everybody contributes-ish or everybody gets penalized. The midday is where you're going to be acquiring cards in order to have better actions. And then you're also going to be completing tasks or objectives along the way as a whole. You're going to be clearing out more land and space potentially on this board in the first place in order to place things further along. And then the last evening phase is also going to entail a story phase where if you can complete a story, you're going to get additional victory points as a whole. Again, is this looking like something that you might enjoy? Semi-cooperative worker placement in the sense, well, you better be careful or you could get screwed, right? And so it breaks you down how that resource management is going on here as you're placing these tokens down on the board, not sure what's there or not sure who's going to get what, depending on what is laid down. As I said, with midday, getting your actions, getting the villagers, building the village, the tasks or restoring the land. And then down here in the evening, telling those stories or swapping out the resources. You play all four seasons and if a village isn't prepared, everybody loses, but someone with the most points could win if you do your job well enough. That's it. $59 is going to get you a base game. 66 gets you a little bit of uh, charity there as well. The Cherokee reservations uh, for libraries and schools on those reservations. A little bit of add-ons there from one of their previous games and a few stretch goals to give you a little bit of deluxified if you want that sort of thing. So Winter Rabbit, I mean, it's killing it actually for a game again that I didn't even know was going to be launching this week. Never heard of in the first place. $28,000 there, almost at 150% of the funding goal. So go check it out. Now we're going over here and talking about The Lady and the Tiger with three new games. Uh, in their boxed set, if you will, here. 65% of the way funded here, and we've got three different games that are going to be available with a wide variety of player counts, Wormlord, Dragon Races, and Take It or Leave It. Wormlord is going to give you the solo aspects where you're protecting and comboing cards in a strategic way in order to take out the dragons in front of you as they get powered up, depending on which ones they steal, and leaving you with none of your own in the first place. Then, skipping over it there for a second, Dragon Races, cunning strategy, mind-bending game, they say, of simultaneous bidding. It's not just the highest bid that matters, but your ability to meta outplay your opponents. It utilizes a hidden bidding style of situation where you're going to be flipping over destination cards. It reminds me a little bit of my kid's game, Owl Upon Owl. It has the different colors around the track. And so when you play a card of red, you move an available owl to the next open red space. But if you cover up several red spaces on there, maybe they move a little bit further. Maybe the red space is just one in front of you, but maybe the orange space is four spaces away from where that owl is. So obviously you wanna go that. And so it gives me a little bit of that vibe in the simultaneous 
face down bidding token style in order to figure out who gets successful bids and who doesn't on a turn by turn round by round basis. And the rules break it down a little bit further here. They say, look, if one person bid one number, nobody else bid that number, they go. Then if nobody won the solo bid, the highest group of everyone bidding together wins. If no one did that as well, then the highest bids. And they give you a bunch of examples here. So that's kind of a unique spin on it. But again, it's a three to five player count dynamic. And I'd make the argument that realistically four or five would absolutely be necessary because I'm not sure this would necessarily be quite as strong with three. The last one, again, as you can see here, take it or leave it bluffing for two to seven players. Going back over the page here, you can get a little bit more of a sense of things because you're going to be slowly predicting customers' ever-changing desires while you know your competitors are trying to do the same thing. Basically, more almost sounding like a let's make a deal. You know, the final, there's three rooms and they're trying to figure out which prize they want to bet for or go for. And that's what you're kind of doing here with two to seven players as you're moving these doors around and trying to make people think whether or not the wares are at the door that you're going for. And they're just figuring out or trying to meta, meta, meta guess whether or not you're bluffing or actually going for the right one in the first place. And then here, if you want to get all three of them, it's going to be 19 bucks. You want to get a bunch of their old stuff, $29. Somehow, again, 11 games for 39 bucks and 16 games for 45. Again, as I always say on these multi-game campaigns, buy the one that you really love. Otherwise, you're spending more to save more and you're still spending more. Jabberwocky, uh, it's eight and one, it says here. I don't even remember this one, truth be told but you can get a Jelly Beans bundle here if you want some of their other previous catalog as well. So a few minor stretch goals and shipping is gonna be whatever, $8. So take that for what you will. Again, $27 for a couple small box games. That's Lady and the Tiger series. Then we're talking Pluto Dinerama, building a diner in space as a three phase sort of system where you're slowly gathering resources by the use of the cards, which are going to have numbers on them, but also the icons you need in order to seat your customers in the first place. And then you're going to be then going through the line, trying to seat as many as you can, using up those resources uh, before you or the evil corporation as a semi-cooperative game, because if the evil corporation gets more customers, then they win and you all lose. Or if you're the first person to seat 10 customers, you potentially win because you don't actually win though, because it's based on how many stars uh, you're going to be getting from your various attributes, including the customers, the actual ambiance in the first place, and some of the other small factors that are gonna go, go into this. And at the end of every round, after you uh, seat or don't seat a certain number of customers, depending on the player count, then you go to an end phase, which is where you draw an event card. There are three different types of events that are going to be available to you, more sort of the non-strategic as well as the strategic, depending on how cutthroat you want this game to be, as they say, because you can have a ton of fun losing. That's my uh, catchphrase on this channel. You know, uh, I have a ton of fun losing all the time, right? And then you just rinse and repeat because you basically get two actions of the three possible actions on a turn by turn basis, but you can not duplicate and they're drawing cards, getting those resources, getting those actions or hiring more workers, whatever the card style looks like, because you're going to have ambiance, workers and food, essentially. And you're going to need a certain amount of food and ambiance in order to see customers. But you're also going to have workers that will have asymmetric actions as well, or just upgrades for your, you know, dynamic engine in the first place, including just things like more actions per turn or more resources or certain things that you can do along the way. That's it. That's the whole game. Uh, the pledge down here is going to be, it's probably faster scroll on this side. Uh, it's going to be 30 bucks. So it gets you the base game and some personal placemats, as they say here. Uh, that's about all you need to know. And again, like I said, you can kind of do a couple different modes here. The strategist, if you want to be a little bit more, um, well, strategic and that just basically takes out the creative in the game events that i talked about at the end and it just kind of gives you examples of here right the last dinorama standing receives an event token so uh going a clockwise circle you have five seconds to name a celebrity whose name starts with the last letter of blah 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 blah, blah right so those are the sort of things that the events are going to be in so that's why they say it's going to be marketed also as a little bit of a party game so does that encourage you does that entice you or do you just want a lunchbox for 25 bucks additionally with this artwork so if you do you can skadoosh sorry uh we're watching that movie right now uh but it's got 18 grand so give it a look see then we're talking northwest 150 percent of its funding goal is 7500 dollars and what this is doing essentially is it's a deluxified wooden based cube pattern matching game 
it gives me a little bit of Tintas because at the start of the game, you just place the main cube down, replacing a mushroom token. And then afterwards, depending on what token is replaced by the previous person, that dictates the movements of what next token you can take to sort of uh, have your tableau. Because you're building this sort of grid-based situation where you're going to be having the option of where you put a cube next to the previously orthogonally adjacent one to give you the pattern matching again, because each of these different iconography cubes are going to give you different different ways of scoring them in the first place as you can see here like mushrooms and leaves and all sorts of different arrangements the pine cones or the trees and so how you score them is going to depend on how many are next to each other or what else is adjacent to it just like you would expect with a set collection sort of thing with a little bit of a 3d element uh, spatial arrangement if you will uh, rule book is right there but that's it you basically go until you fill up your grid or no pine cones are left and then you score accordingly so uh, there you go. That's it. $15 flat shipping. But I mean, $30, frankly speaking, isn't too bad from that aspect as well. So if you want to do local pickup, they got that too. That's kind of cool. And you know what? There's only one pledge level, which is also kind of nice. But that's it. That's all it is. And you can check it out and see if it's up your ilk. Then we're talking Minecart Town. This is a remake from Jelly Jelly, Japanese designer here, uh, basically trying to get it to a wider audience because it came out originally in 2023 with a little bit more this time around, a one to fourth layer tile placement game. And what you've got is like 78 different unique tiles. And you're going to be basically going through a multi-phase system of activating, producing on all of your tiles, allocating any of those resources in order to buy more tiles and laying them down orthogonally against or next to adjacent tiles in the first place. And then also using tracks that are gonna be available to you over a four round basis to upgrade those tracks, but to produce and bring those resources in order to buy those said tiles in the first place previously right wasn't kidding 78 unique tiles and like any of these japanese games if you don't get it on crowdfunding chances are you're just not going to get it period and jelly jelly uh they put out a bunch of other games so they're not an unknown from the japanese side of things a uh, couple good rules videos there as well if you want to know and this is the design change that they've done since the previous edition and you can also go on board game geek and see what people are saying about it over there so uh, it's going to be $45. And again, like I said, is that a good price? Probably because again, you're probably not going to find it on the secondary market if you like that thing. And you know what? Um, you know, Cardboard East here, go check out his video. He'll give you all the rundown on all this stuff. I trust him as one of my main sources for this type of game or, you know, that market in the first place. So he does a really good job of covering that. So check that out if you want as well. Uh, but there you go. There's a solo mode, rule book online, as well as tabletop simulator. And let's get this thing funded. Tell them Leech sent you minecart town. Then last up, we're talking scarce deck building worker placement post apocalyptic world. As you kind of dive down here, because you can see that there's a 3D element aesthetically uh, scheming uh, for the actual board itself because you're gonna be deck building in terms of a cooperative or competitive mode with you're the captain of this ship diving around, grabbing resources, but if you stay down too long, you either run into events or monsters that you're going to have to deal with. Commanding your crew, enhancing the vessel as you go along the way and navigating the depths as you go. You're gonna have missions, you're gonna have movement, you're gonna have abilities, you're gonna have battling, you're gonna have everything going on along those sides of things. The rule book is a little bit of a denser read, truth be told, and it gives you a little bit of a decent turn order here in terms of drawing your cards, taking your actions, and utilizing the three different things that are gonna be available to you in terms of movement, the actual action themselves, or discarding to perform further actions with a card management style or basis. The game ends if the enemy reaches their city on the surface, and all the players lose then. But if you don't have enough player cubes in the city as well, you're gonna lose in addition. So again, it's a little bit of a different vibe. I'd definitely say this one is the most opaque in terms of how the turns and the interactions are gonna go this week. So if you're actually interested in this one, this is one of those ones that I will say, go watch a video instead of probably reading the rule book because I think you're gonna get more out of it in that sense because you can kind of see, okay, here are the city tiles, the vessel tiles, all the things that you're doing on each of these and how you're traversing back and forth with them. And then there's energy leaking, cards that you're going to have to mitigate because otherwise the timer goes along further so again i'd say just give it a look see if they funded in the first 48 hours they were given a little freebie here so it doesn't look like that's going to be the case and but they're well still on track to be funding before the end of their campaign with 135 people and three quarters of the way there so do you want plastic minerals and uh you know stl file i mean that's kind of what you're getting with the extra stuff here and it's expensive for that sense, you know, 66 bucks. Either way, if you're interested down here, you can check out some of the preview stuff. But again, I'd maybe see just the how to play more than anything else. Although truth be told, again, this is a 33 minute how to play. So 
wasn't kidding about that rule book. So maybe you are better off reading the rule book in the first place. Either way, give it a look see. It might be funded by the end of the weekend if they're lucky. So that's scarce. So there you go. That is the roundup for this week. All that is new that I am covering. So we'll see what tomorrow's news and upcoming stuff looks like as well. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll go on a rant or two about crowdfunding projects that have yet to fulfill. You know, we touched on Onimaru, but again, no update since my last video either. And there's another one that's not quite as egregious, but also much larger in scope that isn't we're anywhere close to fulfilling. And it really kind of just every once in a while pops up on my radar because it was one of those that I saw just a ton of hype for as well years ago, like three years ago, even right. Still play testing three years later. Not even necessarily done playtesting the core game. Whew. Those are, eef, you know? And this one had like a whole, like, we're talking three, $500 plus. Extra stuff in the pledge manager. How much of this stuff do you need? You know what I'm talking about. Can you guess what it is? Let me know what you think it is down in the comment section below. And we'll probably talk about it tomorrow. Because there's only a few things on the big news agenda that I need to, you know, talk about. And. You know, I get free time on a video. Oh boy, it's going to go off the rails any which direction. You know, this is my channel. I love talking about fun stuff related to board games. So just a good time. Just a good time. Have a great freaking day. Thanks for watching. Subscribe? Question mark? I don't know. I should say that more often at the beginning of the video, I guess. I don't know. I still feel like a show when I say it. I don't know. That's all I got. Peace out.